speech language pathologists are autonomous professionals, I didn't know that word was going to be there, but that's interesting, who have expertise in typical development and disorders of communication and swallowing, as well as assessment and intervention for these areas. So that's how we're defined by our national organization. And I just wanted to put that little uh, diagram up because when I first became a student in 1970 um, in the master's program in speech language pathology, uh, we had to read a book called The Speech Chain. And so what I didn't realize as I'd come in from a background in foreign languages and music that uh, I was going to have to know all about the brain, the ear, the sensory system, the sound waves, vocal muscles, motor nerves, and all at different levels, and that it wasn't just going to be auditory because there's a whole visual system and tactile system. It was like, oh, <laughs> is that what we need to know? So that is what we're supposed to know. That's really interesting. Um, so, <laughs> professional organizations. Canadian Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists, and the provincial body, as Pat has mentioned, and the colleges. So, the relevant organizations for us here in British Columbia, um, CASLPA, which has 6,000 plus members, 3,700 in the SLP zone, the others being audiologists. Um, and since 1987, there's been a certification exam for CASLPA that students uh, do after they're finished. Um, and in also, um, there's required hours of coursework and externship. Um, it's voluntary in some sense, but in British Columbia it relates to the college, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and in British Columbia we also, as we said, have the CASIPA and the group uh, working on autism. So what is the college? Uh, that's only been around for a couple of years, um, mandatory membership since 2010, requires a master's degree, degree in SLP and to pass the CASIPA exam, so that's how the link is with the CASIPA plus other things like character letters, criminal record check, practice insurance. And at the current time, um, 963 SLPs are registered in that um, body. And uh, just like to say for those of you who are sort of more new to the profession or not in the profession, um, in 1973 and 4, when I was president of B. Castlepa, um, we tried to get um, licensing, and so it's real interesting that it took that long. Um, but that's the way it is uh, in politics in British Columbia. So, um, part two. We're already at part two. This is good. Scopes of practice. So, one of uh, the recent grads suggested to me that one way to think about what it is we're supposed to know is to look at what are the questions on the CASIPA exam and uh, what's the proportion. And it's kind of interesting when you look at it that uh, the big area um, uh, for relevance for autism is actually also the big area for the, the CASIPA exam. So, developmental language and arctic phrenology disorders. Um, and then some other things to do with principles of practice, augmentative communication, I mean, and a bunch of other things. But what's kind of that? What kind of struck me was how much of the exam is based in the in the children's um, field, actually. So that was kind of interesting, and that's pretty well explains where we mostly work. Most of us work in, in with children and, and adolescents. Um, so, recently CASIPA is sort of moving in a bit of a different direction, um, reflecting sort of trends in health professions generally, um, is so that not just exams and hours and externships and so on, but um, sort of pr proving competencies um, in certain areas. So there's been a big push to try and understand what do we need to be competent in. Um, so one of the, um, the, well the seven areas that have been identified, service delivery obviously, uh, um, communication, collaboration, advocacy, management, scholarship and professionalism. And it's really interesting that collaboration um, and advocacy are right there um, in the middle of all of that. So what do we expect um, from our uh, graduates to apply knowledge of a large number of disciplines, cognition, linguistics, socio-behaviorism, biomedical, pharmaceutical, and physical sciences that are relevant to human communication processes and swallowing, and to know and apply knowledge about typical and atypical development, differences and disorders of human communication, including hearing 
and hearing disorders. So that's the overall competencies and foundations. Um, and then to apply principles of client-centered clinical practice in a cross-cultural context, um, including use of diagnostic and rehab instrumentation and procedures, behavioral management, social interaction management, and counseling regarding communication. And one of the key points uh, under collaboration, which is uh, 3.1, 3.2 in that uh, new document, um, to work with others to provide an integrated approach to client services, respect personal and professional differences among coworkers, and support positive team dynamics. So it's interesting that you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago, um, that wouldn't have been sort of considered part of the of the competencies. I mean, it was an assumed. It was assumed, but it wasn't uh, written in black and white. So I think that's very interesting. Our our regulating body um, at the the national level um, is now considering that interprofessionalism to be uh, a key part of our practice. So part three. We're at part three already. Education of SLPs. Um, in the Canadian context, this is all we're going to talk about because um, it gets a bit complicated if you add Australia and New Zealand, Britain and U.S. Starts with undergraduate preparation and prerequisites and is complete when you've finished your clinical master's degree. So that's like a six-year minimum and many of our incoming students have actually had more than that. Some people come with other degrees, some people come with extra courses to get their prerequisites and so on. So it's a minimum of six years. Um, and in BC and in some other provinces, um, you have to have acceptance by a college body. So what does the undergraduate preparation look like? Um, a linguistic speech science or psych degree um, or post-BA diploma with prerequisites in linguistic psychology, anatomy, and physiology. And the domains of language um, in a cross-linguistic sense, so knowing more than just about English, um, and knowing about human development and behavior, language, cognitive and social, anatomy and physiology of the brain, hearing, language, and speech mechanisms, and research methods including basic stats. So what do we mean by the domains of language? We're talking about on the one hand understanding, on the other hand producing, so receptive and expressive, some people use those words. Um, and we divide that in a sort of global way into three types of aspects of language, form, content, and use. So language form, the phonology or the speech sounds and or sign movements, the structures of words, the speech acoustics, articulatory phonetics, and also form of grammar, syntax, uh, the formation of sentences. So that's the one aspect of, of study. And the other two aspects um, are con more connected to each other in some ways. So language content really focuses in on semantics, the meanings of words and the relationships of meanings between words. And finally, and, and very importantly for people with ASD, um, is the use of language in a conversational context, in a narrative context, or in terms of literacy. So we use words like discourse and pragmatics. So what about Canada and the master's programs? Highly competitive to get in. There's nine in Canada now and more coming along. Uh, depending on the program, 20 to 50 students a year are admitted. Um, there's a minimum two years of coursework. Clinical placements and practica in a variety of settings, preschool, school aged and adult, across the required scopes of practice. And for graduating requirements, there's various, depending on the university, uh, there might be comprehensive exams, uh, students might do small research projects, or they might do a thesis. And at UBC, just so you know what that kind of uh, applicant success rate is, one in five of the people who apply get accepted on average. Um, so, what are we thinking about when we're trying to talk about autism spectrum in the master's curriculum? Um, the foundations are developmental language and speech disorders, scope, assessment, and intervention. We're concerned about evidence-based principles and strategies in all language and speech domains, and we're concerned with interprofessional practice. 
And so what do we mean by levels of evidence? Um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at that. Um, this has been um, adapted through ASHA from the uh, Scottish Medical Intercollegiate Framework. So and if we were talking about evidence, uh, you know, the highest standard of evidence these days um, would be with randomized control trials and well-designed meta-analyses of more than one of those trials. So uh, different kinds of treatments are put against each other and randomly assigned subjects are there. Um, and then you see what the outcomes are and compare them. And the, that is in the green and then the blue um, is just well-designed controlled studies, so studies that have uh, subjects without the problem and then with the problem or subjects that are, have the problem and other subjects with the same problem that are going to be control subjects. Um, or well-designed quasi-experimental studies, so using single subject design and then repeating that over several uh, iterations. And then closer to the bottom of evidence it would be your case studies, non-experimental studies without controls, um, expert committee reports, and so on. In the current framework of um, speech-language pathology, most of the uh, studies um, are in the blue. Um, with the occasional one in the green. In terms of autism, um, it sort of fluctuates in, in the middle there. So what kind of focus coursework uh, do university programs in Canada usually include? Um, something on special populations, including social affective disorders such as autism and AAC and clinical training in all um, age groups, although adults might be limited in terms of ASD depending on placement. Okay, so what, what is it we actually do? So that's where we've been and, and hopefully learned something. Our perspective basically at the beginning here is that all people have difficulties in use of communication and language if they have what we call autism spectrum disorders. And many people, at least in the first few years of life, also have difficulties in language communication content, semantics, in other words, or form. But the primary and sort of um, key aspect is the use of communication and language. So how, how do we see about that in an overall perspective? Um, well, people are people first, um, and their diagnosis second. That, that is sort of our major perspective. Uh, a person is endowed with multiple abilities and needs across a wide range of cognitive, motor, linguistic, and social domains. So we're thinking of a person and we're thinking of all of the things about the person. It's also a perspective that people are not the same over time, that they change with time and they change with intervention. And thus interventionists, whoever we are, need to adapt to the specific client or the specific family with respect to the source and severity of the difficulty, um, with respect to environmental supports that might be there and barriers that might be there, um, and the perspectives of those environmental um, supports and barriers, and the client and family abilities, need, culture, and wishes. So thinking again in the broader sense, um, people first and problem second. And where does SLP fit into that also? Um, thinking about this for a few hours, um, as I did for this talk, um, I realized that actually we have a very multiple, multiple perspective approach to most things we do. And I started thinking about, you know, the fact that, in fact, all of us on a daily basis work and live with assumptions and theories. And to be practitioners that are successful, um, we need to figure out what our theories and assumptions are, uh, make them visible to other people, um, be active in, in understanding them, and if possible, you know, test out our theories and assumptions. So we might assume I'm supposed to do this. Um, but after a while we decide, whoa, doing that doesn't seem to have much of an impact on anybody. So being able to move 
our perspectives, our theories, and assumptions if the evidence in front of us um, doesn't support what we're doing. And so part of that is, you know, living with assumptions and working with that. And secondly, um, in this training programs, um, students learn and we work with a multiple uh, set of theories and approaches. So there are many theories about language development and that provides us with multiple options um, for speech language intervention with people with autism. So let's look at assessment. What are we thinking of when we want to be um, assessing a child or a young adult? Um, on the one hand, uh, we have to take care of the domains of language, the form of language, the content of language, the use of language. We also need to get the perspectives from the client, whether it's the client, him or herself, or the caregivers. Um, we want to take those results that we have and compare them with some criteria or some norms. Um, and so those are sort of our basic aims. And then it's not an assessment until you've devised a management plan, whether it's a plan to just say this person doesn't need help or a plan to do something. And we need to think about what's our long-term objectives and our short-term objectives. And in creating the plan, we also need to think about what the barriers, supports, and strategies for intervention are going to be and plan for ongoing evaluation over time. So that's just an overview of what assessment is. And that can include a large number of tasks, such as samples of communication, checklists or interviews with caregivers, standardized norm reference tests, dynamic assessment strategies where you test, teach, retest, see if your teaching has any effect, uh, doing assessments of play, um, comparing assessment of nonverbal and verbal imitation skills. And what do we mean by communication samples in the form content use? Um, these can be naturalistic, where you're just collecting what the child does with the parent or with you. Um, or they can be focused probes, where you have a certain set of goals in mind that you want to see if they can do X, Y, or Z. Uh, they can be spoken, they can be written, they can be gestural. Um, and what you're doing is trying to find something relevant to, to count, basically. So it's measurement of relevant variables. And once you have some measurements, um, then you can compare those with some databases. So for example, the systematic analysis of language tr transcripts on the next slide, um, it provides us with some databases of what to expect from kids um, at certain developmental levels from a language sample. And then making comparisons of a person across time. So for example, um, we might com come up with some kind of a profile after doing analysis with the language sample so that we see the syntax up here, the length of utterance, um, the semantics, different number of different words, type token ratios of words, and we can get an, a number of um, numbers for this child and then compare them to the database so that we have some method of making a criterial reference. Similarly, in phonology, there's lots of things we can count. We can count consonants and vowels. We can count what we call phonological features. We can count the structures of words, the CV sequences, and stress patterns, and word length. There's in, in, in innumerable things to count. And you can have lovely things like that at the end of the day. And some of my ex and former and current students are in the room who will appreciate how much work that is. But we have computers that make our life easier. Okay, so what about nonverbal or minimally verbal children? We're not going to be counting their phonological forms or their syntactic forms. Um, but there's lots of other things we can count. So we can count communicative acts. So the number or proportion of or rate of time of number of communicative acts. We can count how many times a child is intentional versus non-intentional in the form of communication, variety of types of forms. We can count the purposes of communication. Does the child request, comment, express, and so on? And we can count initiations and responses. And for people with autism, um, even if they're verbal, some of these are really important. So what other kinds of assessment tools if we're not using the communication samples? Uh, if the children are nonverbal or minimally verbal, we have a number of checklists that um, we refer to. 
Um, and again, we're looking at form content and use, but most of those checklists are a little bit less on the use and more on the form and content. Or we can do standardized tests, um, which really focus on language form and content, and have a developmental perspective um, that's as good as the norm reference sample. So we always have to check who is in the norm reference sample before we use the test. Um, and I'll just take a small aside here for a second to say um, a very recent study in Australia of uh, indigenous children, Aboriginal children, um, were tested on the self. Um, and uh, those uh, scores did not match up with teacher perspectives on how those children's language competencies were doing. Um, so what they did then was get from the uh, spe specialists in um, Aboriginal English dialects in Australia, Ian Malcolm and Andy Butcher, um, and looked at what the children did on the self compared to what they would do if they had Aboriginal English, and then readjusted the scores, which of course went up quite a lot. And then with the adjusted scores, those matched uh, the teacher perceptions. So what I'm just saying is here, we have to be careful when we use these tools, not just for Aboriginal children, but for people of other cultures and other backgrounds. I just want to put that there. So standardized tests is something we do, but it has to be done with caution. Um, so we have a number of those. Some of you may have seen those in the reports. I'm not going to talk about them because I want to talk a little bit about intervention. So what are the strategies? Well, we have a continuum of strategies and approaches that reflect the child and family needs and practitioners involved from very highly structured behaviorist kinds of approaches to very general indirect support. Um, we can are concerned about the domains of communication, so would create goals for form, content, and use. And we're concerned about the age and the developmental span. So taking kids from pre-verbal, non-intentional, to complex language, including oral and written language. And where do we start moving from long-term to session goals? Well, we think about where the client is now, the baseline. What's the next step to get to that goal? What is the client ready to learn? And what will the strategies be um, that will help this next step take place? And then how will you know someone's mastered the goal that you've set? Um, you can count things, or you can make subjective uh, interpretations, or you can get the grandmother effect. And I, I guess if I love counting things. I mean, I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't. But I have to say that in, in the real world, um, I'm always more impressed um, with whether the grandmother thinks there's been a change when she hasn't seen the child for a while. Because that's the real world. And so she doesn't have to count anything. She just knows she can talk to her grandchild on the telephone at last. And so that's important to me. So both qualitative and quantitative approaches to assessment of the effectiveness of treatment. Um, activity planning. So how do we do that? Just taking us through here a very simple thing. We look at the objectives. We consider the physical setup. We describe the activity, the kinds of prompts, cues, methods for recording responses, responses, modifications, potential problems, and conclusions. So when we think, think about a lesson plan, uh, we have to take all of that into account. So that's just a little background about what do we do in general. But I want to talk for the last part of my talk about what options do the theories of language development bring to speech language pathology uh, for people with ASD. And I realized looking back over the, the decades that I've been involved with this profession um, that there have been sort of trends and things working together and sort of it ends up as a Venn diagram where behaviorism, linguistics, um, and social interaction theories all um, have contributed to how we think about speech-language pathology. And all of those theories have evidence for and against in terms of theories of language development and intervention. And then I thought, well, this just reminds me that, you know, really it's probably more than 2,000 years, but there's been a long, long debate about where knowledge and language come from. So on the one hand, you have your Plato and your Descartes thinking, um, I think, therefore I am. The na nativist rationalist view were endowed with innate capacity. On the other hand, you had your empiricist, starting with Aristotle, going through Bacon and Locke. 
um, the, what we learn comes through sensory experience. And so those two big, big things, and of course there's other things in between and around and at the back, uh, but those two big theories you know, are still with us today. Um, and in individuals, in, in, within ourselves, we'll probably have some controversy what we think about that, uh, but certainly among professionals we have that kind of difference. So what about behaviorism or empiricism? Um, basic processes of learning are assumed to direct and control the increasing complexity of children's verbal behavior, and Skinner was an advocate of that theory. Um, and language development is a problem of linking various stimuli in the environment to internal responses, and these internal responses to overt verbal behavior. This had its major impact in speech-language pathology in the 1970s. Um, and that continues today. So there's, it's been there for a long time. What about linguistics? Well, that is so that we can describe language in detail. And we have had different th theoreticians over the years um, say one thing or another. Uh, so for example, on the one hand, we have Chomsky suggesting everything is pretty well universal with language-specific variants, that you're born with it. Um, language faculty is innate and that form and content is independent of language use. So on the one hand you have your competence, on the other hand you have your performance. Um, if from that point of view, from the point of view of linguistics and how language development happens, the environment triggers the maturation of a physiologically based language system but does not shape or train verbal behavior. So interestingly, it, that came into speech language pathology at the same time as uh, behaviorism was there. Um, so that also continues and evolves as the ways of describing language have evolved. Then the interactionist theories became more interesting to people. And the general assumption there um, was that, well, that was very nice and good, what Chomsky said, but in fact, language does happen in an environment and it is contextualized. And so then you've got people like Piaget, Vygotsky, Bates, McWinney, um, and the social, on the cognitive side, and Bruno, Bruner and Tomasello on the social side, and these are just a few people of many, many people. Um, and that entered into uh, SLP in, in the 1980s and continues. And I'll, I'll just say, um, that was kind of interesting because I, I worked for a while, went home to have my kids. Um, while I was having my kids, um, social interactionist theory came into play. And I was like, well, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, when I had my kids, I realized, you know, it's not just them developing, you know, or they're not tabula rasa. You know, I'm actually have some effect on the story. <laughs> not as much as I'd like. <laughs> anyway. And they would say, Mom, you have way too much. <laughs> anyway, because they're old now. But it's um, so a little bit more about the interactionist. The child interacts with the environment in different ways in progressively developing stages of cognition. So we have to remember that, that it's not just the same over time. It's like this happens and then you get to this level and then you get to that level and at each level more stuff can come in from the environment and be processed by your brain. Um, and that theory suggests that cognitive development determines language development because language just is one aspect of cognition. On the information processing side of interactionism, um, all of the parts of language, form, content, and use, are working together in language processing. And so you can't say, here's the module of syntax, and here's the module of phonology, and here's the module of pragmatics. But all of those things actually in interact because the neural networks work together in, or work against each other, as the case may be. And so we have the multiple layers of connections. And then there's the other aspects of the social interactionist theory that the child does have inborn capacities um, and cues the parent uh, for relevant interaction. So that's kind of interesting. So what, what does the child bring to that interaction? They can bring some things that get the parent to do things. So that's very interesting. Um, and so that particular theory merges the maturational part where the child is developing and the environmental part. And so we're thinking then about language functioning in social communication, turn-taking, mutual gaze, joint attention, context, cultural conventions. We think about how parents or caregivers talk to child, child-directed speech, give recasts, and so on. 
Um, and so that, um, as I said, so before I, before I went on leave with my kids, that hadn't been talked about. And after I came back, that was the key thing. So what are some examples of how these theories have influenced speech-language pathology? Um, well, we see in yellow there, uh, the behaviorism point of view uh, promotes us and sort of helps us think about measurement of communication variables. The social interactionist theories help us focus on and plan for interactions, thinking about cognition, thinking about development, thinking about social context. And the linguistic theories in blue there help us think about how to describe all the language domains in detail. So for example, behaviorism has influenced SLP practice to include measurement, to set objectives that are measurable, to analyze tasks, and to consider adults in the child's life to be leaders in the process of change. Linguistics has influenced us to be awestruck in regard to language complexity, and <laughs> that is absolutely the case. I, as some of you will know, I, I, with my husband, wrote a book on phonological development that's kind of long. Um, <laughs> some of you have actually read parts of it, and I commend you and thank you for that. But anyway, the point being that as we were working on one of the chapters in particular, um, where we had tried to do um, a ranking of constraints of phonology, and if those of you don't know what that means, don't worry, it's not <laughs> needed. But just, you know, this one child's phonology, trying to figure out the whole thing and how it all interacted. And I would think, oh, I finally got the, the right ranking of the constraints. And then I would take it and he would read it and he would go, you know, that sounds good, but how did they say that word? And like, oh, no. And so the whole thing would change again. And I'd say, this is just too hard. And he said, well, whoever said um, language was simple? Language is complex, and that's just the way it is. So, okay. <laughs> So that's one thing, be awestruck. And secondly, to describe language in detail. And the more we know, the more we can do that. Um, and then I kind of like this little piece from linguistic theory about how language um, is affected by the environment. So looking for trigger points for language development is kind of interesting. So providing the right input at the right time. And of course, we don't always know what that is. Um, and you know, that's where our problems lie. But the thing is, that would be cool. Like if you're not just giving inappropriate input for the level that the child is at, but you're knowing this is the right time to give this input and that will trigger this change. That's what we're looking for. Um, and then what about the interaction of Syria? How has that influenced our practice? Um, and the cognition development side certainly has given us a developmental perspective concerning relationships between cognition and linguistic stages. Um, for example, when ch children learn means and skills in the Piagetian framework, for example, that seems to correlate with intentional communication. Uh, when they uh, re become good at object permanence, that tends to correlate with a certain vocabulary development of two-word phrases. Uh, when they get to the stage of concrete operations in the Piagetian framework, they tend to do reversible sentences. Uh, so that's all real interesting. We don't know if they're correlational or causal, but that's interesting that they relate to each other. Um, and we're also interested in levels of play. What about the information processing view of interactionism? Um, that has influenced us to think about structuring the input we give or that the caregiver gives to minimize the task demands for things that really matter, like attention, memory, reasoning, complexity, all the different types of motor skills and across domains. So remembering that the child can be good at one thing um, and, and not as good as something else. So use the strong things to help the weak things. So old form, new content, and vice versa. Imitation before expecting spontaneous, single words before phrases, single consonants before clusters, and so on. And it also has influenced us to think about the facilitation of cross-domain effects. It'll be great, like if you don't have to work on all the phonology and all the syntax and all the pragmatics and all the semantics. But what if, if you work on this, it makes an effect over here. That's what we're looking for, is things that are shortcuts that one part of the system can trigger change in another part of the system. And we're not very good at that, because that takes a long time to figure out for an individual person, but it's certainly our goal. Um, and we also want to think about the, the uh, variability the child might have in errors in learning, because uh, people do learn from errors in development. So um, what else has it influenced to do 
Consider the caregivers and clients as equal partners in the intervention process, including, as I said earlier, the grandmother effect. Um, support joint attention and perspective taking. Uh, provide function-oriented input at the child's level. So functional meaning like that if you give a child a picture of a dog, that may not represent all dogs. It might just be, you know, that dog. Um, and so on. How, how do you get that to be functional vocabulary? Um, and to follow the child's lead while leading the child to the next level with input and communicative temptations. And Hannon is one example of that. So in summary, um, SLPs, as I say, work in a multiple perspective framework. Each of us will be more or less one or the other of those kind of people, uh, depending on our personality, our training, our experience. Um, our family background and so on and all of that needs to become clear if, if you are the practitioner whether you're the SLP or you're the person working with the SLP and you want to know what the SLP thinks. The more we understand what framework are we working in and what perspective are we working with that, that will help us talk to other people. Um, and then we also want to attempt to determine what will best support um, a child or a family at the moment. Um, and through the collection of data across form content and use over time. Um, we would like to be flexible and appreciative of input from other people. It's really nice when you have your plan um, and then you meet the child and the child doesn't meet your plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, so, and so flexibility with the child is important, flexibility with the parents is important. Um, and flexibility with other professionals is super important and understanding and saying what have we got to contribute. And finally, um, SLPs strive to take their major role as professionals trained to do communication assessment and intervention. So a few references for you to um, go look up if you want. Thank you.